what I do is if you have ambition to be great, my job is to coach you to get all that greatness out of you. What is good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's a boy Reason, and we are back here for yet another one. And though the media was not allowed at practice today, obviously, man, because there were more notepads are on, doing a little bit of, um, you know, in-class, light field work, stuff like that, um, you'd think there'd not be a lot to talk about, but there is quite a bit to talk about today. Um, we're going to go over that. Uh, you know, Tyreek released a nice video of him and Tua putting in work together. Um, working on, you know, getting their timing down on certain routes in, in, in the tree and such. Um, we got a, a, another, you know, hey, we did five questions with Barry Jackson on the defensive side yesterday. He dropped one on the offensive side. We'll go over that. Um, I've, you know, we've gone over rankings a lot lately, but there's a very good ranking that came out. And if you guys don't know, you know how, I mean, if you don't know, you know, some of you know, some of you don't know, I'm very high on a group called, um, o-line masterminds right um these are the same people who work with taron armstead etc cetera, etc cetera. um some of the best you know you, i mean man literally some of the 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 best o-line you know specialists and coaches in the world are involved in o-line masterminds and you might have um you might have actually heard us talk about them before um o-line masterminds um, not only were do they run Taron Armstead, so you guys might have um, heard us talk about them, but also a famous guy, um, Duke Mayweather. He's considered one of the best O-line coaches in the world. He actually who runs O-line masterminds. Anyways, one of their um, – Brandon Thorne, who, um, you know, he not only writes um, interior – well, defensive line and offensive line – um stuff for establish the run he's an analyst there he's also a scouting coordinator for uh, o-line mastermind so when he puts out his top 75 o-line rankings you pay attention because this is a man who specializes in offensive line scouting it evaluating it analyzing it so he put out his top 75 O-line rankings, um, the top 15 players in all five different positions. So right tackle, right guard, center, left guard, left tackle. I want to go over that because um, that's there's a, it's an interesting list. And, uh, you know, you, you know that boy Teron Armstead made that list. So we'll talk about that. Also, a very good article from the homie Daniel um, Oifusi. Um with the Miami Herald and he, he wrote, um, I was, I didn't have enough time to get to it yesterday. So I pushed it to today, but it's basically what to expect from McDaniel's new offense. And with my film study coming out soon regarding McDaniel's offense and what to expect. I wanted to take a look at this article with you guys. Also USA today, they put up the record projections. So we'll talk about that. We got a lot, a lot to go over, but, um, guys remember from day one to day three, it's no contact, right? Day four, five, six, the helmets, the shells, they'll come on. And then day seven and on, we'll be in full contact. All right? So we'll be next Wednesday, I believe, is when they'll be going into full contact. Based off of what Barry Jackson said yesterday in his article, next Wednesday is when I'm expecting. But day four, five, six, the media will be there with helmets and shells. So there will be stuff to talk about when even the helmets and the shells come on. But I do expect the first three days to be a tad slow, right? So, um, but we're getting there. We're getting there. So, man, you can feel it, man. Like, you know, uh, I'm so excited. This is like, you know, it feels like Christmas Eve. If you think about it, right? It's just an extended Christmas Eve. You know, Christmas Eve is just like three days long. But it feels like Christmas Eve, man. And we just can't wait to unwrap the present of this offense. And, you know, there's a couple of things I did want to talk to before we get into everything. Um, you know, in case you didn't see, Marcel Louis Jock, um, when he was on Big O, he kind of backed up um, what Mike Westhoff had said in, in regard to what he saw at minicamp. You know, Marcel Louis Jock said the offense just didn't look good. Um, it was all over the place. And we're going to talk about, I think that is a where the offense is at is another factor why I think Muhammad Sanu was brought in. Um, so we're going to want to talk about that when we get to Sanu. That, that'll be one of the first things we talk about here. But, you know, you you look at right now, and 
this is why I said, you know, we heard from like Westoff, you heard what Marcel said. This is why I said, you know, I'm not sitting here. I don't give a crap about the open practices all the fans can go to because they can literally make it a controlled environment and show you what they want to show you and make whatever they want to make look good. It's when the media is just there and the fans aren't there, that matters. And it's especially, and I've been saying this since OTAs, I've been telling you all this, when people are making big deals about underthrows, this throw, that throw, what did I keep saying? I kept saying, do not put stock in anything. Take notes, take notice of what's going on, but don't put any stock in anything yet. And specifically, what I mentioned was, when we get into these joint practices, we're going to start getting some answers. It happened last year. I expect it to happen this year because, listen, you can try and have a controlled environment with media or, or you know, fans there. But when you've got another, you know, franchise on the other side of the football and they got things they want to get right. I mean, guys, the Bucks signed Julio Jones today. That, uh, that joint practice, even for our defense, is going to be exciting to watch. Just to see how Boyer is going to, you know, if these guys – get involved and are actually out there, it'll be interesting to see what Boyer does against that def- uh, against that offense. So it's not just like, oh, let's go look at two in the offense. I mean, the offensive line is where my eyes would be locked on. But the defense, you know, the defense is going to see some good looks too, especially, you know, when we get in those trench battles and joint practices for all y'all to see against the Eagles, the Eagles have one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. I'm going to be very interested to see how – our front seven does against them in joint practice. See, it's not just two in the offense. There's a lot of different battles to watch. Joint practices are going to give you a lot of answers. You know, a lot of answers. Not going to give you every answer, but they're going to give you a lot. Shout out to Mike for the $5 super sticker donation. Appreciate you, homie. Love the profile picture of you and your kid too, man. That's awesome stuff. What's going on, Jamie? How you doing? exactly Rome gray knows what's good you know tampa bay will absolutely test us like crazy especially in the secondary i agree bro i agree there's already 280 of you please smash that like button subscribe if you're new guys we got four away from hitting 8500 well, well you know we were like almost 20 away yesterday and i said hey let's see if we can get to it by tonight we're four away from 8500 man so we need four more subscriptions we'll hit 8500 let's get there man Let's get there. I know we're going to hit 10,000 um, this season. Um, I can't wait to, to, to go down the journey for you. 10K is massive. We're, we're only about one and a half away, obviously. So, um, you know, we'll get to 9,000, I'm sure, during training camp. But, man, I appreciate all y'all. All y'all. And, again, go save 15% off at Pick 6 Apparel. Use code Finside the NFL at pick 6 apparelcom I'm telling y'all, any player you want, Mugs, coasters, whatever. I got Javon Holland, Tyree Kill, Tua Tongue of Aloha, um, and Jalen Waddle. Like I'm telling you guys, the pricing is awesome. The delivery is fast. Just go check it out. I'm just saying, it's nice to drink a mug, a dolphin mug, everywhere you go, right? So go check it out. They got coasters, they got everything, they got mouse pads. Go check them out. Pick six apparel.com. Um, and uh, I got manscaped. <laughs> I hate to be the one who says, but I got manscaped by the shorts and curls right now in terms of wanting to uh in terms of wanting to uh sponsor this channel. I got them panicking and running around in a little circle right now. Crazy stuff. We're growing here, and I appreciate all of you for helping me grow, man. It's uh it's been an awesome journey, awesome journey. And man, this is gonna be the third, third training camp for Finside the NFL. And you know the training camp coverage that I do out here is elite. And, you know, I don't even have boots on the ground. Wait till next year when I got boots on the ground. And my, my wife's a year settled into a promotion so I can get out of here and, and get down there and be with you guys. So we're going to be stepping it up, uh, you know, every year we step it up. So I appreciate you, Mr. C. Brown. Honestly, I bought this hat for the purpose of streaming. I don't wear it out. I don't wear it near my kids. I don't wear it nowhere. This is strictly a streaming hat. I don't trust no one around white. Uh, like, yo, man, even under the brim is white. I can't trust no one, you know? Hands always got to be fresh when you touch this thing, you know what I'm saying? Like, this has turned into one of my favorite hats, uh, honestly, man. Fake Spike, bro, I got something in the works. I wanted it launched by the beginning of training camp. 
It's not launched yet. Trust me, I got something in the works for y'all. Y'all gonna like it. I, I was supposed to get on my horn on the horn with uh, someone last week and discuss some stuff. I slacked. I'm gonna get on the horn with them. Uh, maybe after the show tonight and figure some stuff out. But don't worry, I've got some big stuff coming with regard to what you're saying, Fake Spike. All right, not just merch. We got a lot of stuff coming right now that no one even knows. I've been working on, man. I've been moving like you know, you know, real G's moving silence like lasagna, baby. And that's what I've been doing. So I got some big stuff on the way. Um, you know, I'm not gonna go into details. Um, but we got some big stuff on the way, and don't worry, we will take care of those needs by the start of the season, my friend. Don't worry. All right. Um, we will get that. Don't worry. Ronnie, where you been, bro? Haven't seen you in a minute. Ronnie showing up here out of nowhere at 847 on a on July 26th. Where were you been at, bro? Haven't seen you. <sighs> Shout out to Finn's take with CB83. Go give him a subscribe if you can. Uh, his first video should be dropping next week. Go check him out. Exactly. Fake Spike says, I need the hate of snow we run. Oh, don't worry. We got it coming. Shout out to the homie Anthony, man. Anthony, you starting your par pod back up? Plug the pod in the uh, podcast, Anthony. Go plug it in the comment section, brother, so I can plug it for you when you're coming back, et cetera, et cetera. All right? <laughs> Ronnie says I've been watching from afar like a jealous ex-boyfriend. Oh boy. Kills 1811. You have been here from the beginning and about to hit 10k soon too. I love it, man. You know what I love all y'all about y'all y'all? Like, man, even in the slow season, y'all show up and you show out. You know, when I'm hitting 60, 70, 80 percent or above. In the slow season of my subscription count, I love it, man. I appreciate all of you for continuing to support me, man. Just sharing the stuff, hitting the like button. That's enough, man. You know, if we get that four those four subs tonight to get to 8,500, let's do it, baby. Let's do it. Uh, let's do it. Ronnie out here saying, you know, he never left, bro. Damn, you were sitting in the shadows, huh? Receive he says it's been a while to think we on episode 518. Yeah, bro. Jesus. Jesus, man. You know, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy, man. And I've been looking and I was looking over, you know, July and stuff. And I was like, man, I'm still averaging a video every two days when you do the numbers or whatever. And for a slow season, man, y'all y'all make it, you know, y'all make it enjoyable to come out here and and do everything. Do I think Sanu will stick? We'll talk about that, bro. Don't worry. We're going to that's the first thing we're going to get into um, in a few minutes here. We're going to hop right in. I'm just giving people a few moments to hop in. So, Marino Goat, I've been there since to a draft night on TD's channel when EM went off. Oh my God. I'll never forget that. Uh, Jay Zam says, Reason, when are you going from the class to the grass? We need you at training camp. I was going to do it this This season, was going to be, we were going to go balls deep. Um, but my wife got a promotion and like a big promotion and due to her big promotion you know it's it's looking like i won't be down there until at least february so um you know what i mean it's gonna be a while what up jimmy bones how you doing ian baller franklin Lejeu, stevie let's shout everyone out um df here um aladina I don't, Aladino, I don't want to butcher your name. Randy, um, the Raging Fins Maniac, Gatekeeper, Scotty Joe. Um, who else we got here? What's up? Dylan Schneck, um, Fake Spike 94, so of course. Robert Carrillo, Vicken, Woodson, Anthony, like I said earlier, South Florida Dawn, uh, 1017 Man, also a supporter, Mike Koo. Mr. C.W. Brown, Fake Spike 94, CB83, um, Richard McLean, um, Joe Levesque, Steve O3, 30,000. He's upgraded. Kevin Etienne, Michael Polisic, Garn79, Dub MCs, um, Lozen561, Nicholas D, um, Jamie Zarilla, the homie Rome Gray. I shouted you out, right, Scotty Joe? If I didn't, there it is. Larry Shade, Vaughn954, Topher, 
Angel, um, Andrew Harris, um, Bull Mastiff ND, Coke Master D, bro. You all these names, Coke Master D, Diesel 999. I wonder this man did. It's snowing. Wherever Coke Master D is, it's snowing right now. Jason Keck. Uh, Mario five five two five Mike C, um, decisional power, man. I'm going back to the beginning here. Chad, um, cool iguana. That's an amazing name. Uh, Raul, what's going on? Um, glue gloss. Um, Joseph Jeremiah Kelly, what's going on, Jeremiah? How you doing, brother? John, um, Omar Brown. I see a donation from D Hugga popped up. Hi Lee, baby. Been there since the Bobby Box spray hunt for two. Yo, Hi Lee. It's a new note, bro. It's when I watch these, like all these card accounts pop up and all these people on Dolphins Twitter are in the cards, bro. I was doing that years ago, bro. Years ago, bro. Jeff Premont, King Z305, Xavier, um, real real special K. Are you real special K? You need to hang out with Coke Master D if you are, brother. Shag Fins, Hammer, um, Dolphins Nation. I want to get this right. Toa, 684, Caddy Shack. What's up? Ish the Human, Philip LaDuke, Eric. Um, Skimo Fins. I'm going to get Cement Eskimo Fins. Um, Wayne, what's up, bro? I haven't seen you back here in a while. Um, thank you, Raul. Appreciate you. D hug all day. What's going on, my guy? Just wanted to show some love, my bro. Keep up the good work. D hug all day. Always supporting the channel, always holding me down. Tony Marine, what's going on, brother? Marcus J Q D V. Um, Michael Fisick, um, Dev 2 V. Um, MF Fins One. What's up, brother? You've been here, man. Shout out to MF Fins One. He sent me a package and I actually tracked it today. It should be here in the next couple of days, bro. Bob Oliver. Um, Thomas Nelson, Rashad Will, um, Marlboro Man. Honestly, bro, every time I see Marlboro Man, I think of like Duff Man, but cigarettes. It's amazing. Um, bro, I'm Filet, um, Filet Mon Angon. I, I, I'm not trying to root but your name, bro. Um, Falmon, I guess it's Falmon. What's up, brother? Um, I, I don't want to butcher your name, bro. Rick Hernandez, what's going on? I'm going to say Fileman. I'm going to say Fileman. Fileman, what's going on, bro? I gave you three shout outs because I didn't want to butcher your name, bro. I keep saying it over and over again. Fileman, Fileman, Fileman. What's up, brother? Um, Avs champ to 2022. Yes, I predicted the Avs would win the Stanley Cup. So I like you. Uh, <laughs> Ray, what's going on? SJ210, what's going on, brother? What? What? what, what uh, what, what do you mean, brother? Jamie, does the show have to be tagged as music? Pip doesn't work. I don't know. I have no idea what you're talking about, Jamie. I've tried to answer your question, but I got no idea. Um, Dev is talking about two was forced to throw against the Titans. Um, yo, hey, gatekeeper, that's actually something interesting I wanted to talk about, too. Let's talk about that just for a sec before I get into, into everything here. What you said here, and speaking of worth, that could go ask the Cardinals. Um, what's going on? Um, Adriel Hart, Stewart, X Men, what's going on? All right, okay, check it. I wanted to bring it up. You bring up a good point. Okay, so remember I brought up when everyone was talking about work ethic with two, and I said film study was the issue with two that I was hearing. Remember that? Remember we go back and that's what I heard that it was film study. It had nothing to do with work ethic. It was basically McDaniel walked in and said, you know, who the hell taught this kid how to watch film? Right. You remember that? And, and I don't know if you, you guys remember the show. I did a whole show based on it. Anyways. um, What's going on? Um, real spec. Um, so anyways. When you see, I don't know if anyone saw, but wording came out in Kyler Murray's, you know, some of the details of Kyler Murray's contract came out and he has to have four hours of independent study per week, uh, you know, independent film study, 
Okay. And there's actually wording in the contract that, you know, if he's watching TV while studying or if he's playing games or if he's doing anything that distracts him, even if he's done the four hours, that nullifies the four hours and it doesn't count. He's got to restart again. Okay. And this is something I wanted to talk to because it's a conversation we had backstage yesterday, a couple of us. And, you know, what what people are failing to realize right now is go look at all these quarterbacks, right? Like, you you go look at where two is at right now. You go look at where Trevor Lawrence is. Um, you know, Trey Lance, I don't want to say because he hasn't played the position long. You know, but let's use, like, to uh, Trevor Lawrence, and let's talk about like what that article said yesterday about Mahomes, where the defensive coordinator in the NFL defensive coordinator was like, you get him off his first read, he's relying on his legs and making throws, you know, instead of going through his progressions naturally to second to third, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? The problem, and and I talked about this, you know, the problem I've identified here, and Justin Fields, perfect, another example, Joseph. The problem we're identifying here with these guys is. Colleges are now college universities, colleges, whatever. They are now like the big ones. So like Alabama, Oklahoma, Ohio State, the big power ones, all right? The big power ones. All right. All these power schools now. The issue is they're trying to find as as good of a natural passer or as great of an athlete as they can. Then they throw them in the position and they're doing all the work for them. Like you look at what Herbert had, right? Herbert came into the NFL, the guy, you know, four over a four point GPA in, you know, you know, by molecular, I believe it's like that, something crazy. But he also had Pep Hamilton, right? So he had a guy that would sit him down, et cetera, et cetera. When you look at Burrow, when Burrow came here, they were running very similar offensive scheme to what LSU was running. Right, and it was already kind of a pro system, but also in Burrow's final year at LSU, he was doing correspondence. So what that means is all of his online, all of his courses were online. So what he was doing is he was spending all day with the coaches in the football facilities, watching film, breaking things down, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So he had that, like Herbert didn't have that in his final year. Tua didn't have that. Hertz didn't have that. You look at Hertz right now. Why has Hertz never become a better passer since the time he went from Alabama to Oklahoma to where he is now? You see a little bit of an improvement, but it took him getting to the NFL level and someone actually working with him as a passer, and he's not that improved. I mean, I don't think he's better than Tua. The only thing that makes him deadly is his athleticism. That guy loses his legs. It's over with, all right? The, the, the thing that I'm saying here is if you look at a lot of these big people, look at Lawrence's struggles last year. Dabo Sweeney brought Lawrence, you know, prototypical size, gifted athlete, already a great natural passer, threw him to the wolves. You look at Tua's talk about what happened in Alabama, how they prepared everything for him. See, the issue with all these big schools we're getting into is all these coordinators are worried about their next job. So unless the coach is an offensive mind who's really hands-on with his quarterback and his offense and developing guys, you're, you're getting coaches that are trying to find the best natural athlete, the best natural passer, throw them in there for their three or four years, it's like, why did Herbert not become a one of the biggest knocks on Herbert coming out was he did not take any substantial leap really from a sophomore to a senior. The leap didn't happen until he got to the NFL under Pep Hamilton, a quarterback whisperer, right? Also, the offense was holding him back. It was a very horizontal horizontal offense, right? Um, because they were still based off a lot of Chip Kelly principles in Oregon, right? And with a guy arm like that, you got to stretch the field, right? So anyways, so now, you know, Kyler Murray and the wording that he needs four hours of independent film study per week, I'm telling you right now, it's the same deal of what I reported to you guys when all the work ethic stuff was going on about two, and I told you, no, 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 no. I've been told to McDaniel and the staff don't like his film study habits and film study habits based on how he's learned to watch film over through all the NFL and Alabama OCs he's been through, right? Cause he's been through five. What if we include, if we include two last year, he's been through six OCs in the last five years. All those guys watched 
film differently. All those guys attack film differently, et cetera, et cetera. So he's never had a consistent. Now we've got the guy who's like a film, right? So anyways, my whole point that I'm going off with here is we're starting the Kyler Murray thing and some of these quarterbacks, the slow blinker or whatever you want to say, a lot of it is a result of these universities and these colleges. They're not putting in the work as developing as passers. Listen to my homie Martin. Martin, when he comes up here, played for FAMU, et cetera. He, what's his one big knock on the quarterback position in Florida? That's exact. They don't develop them. They just put the best athlete or the best passer there, and they say go. And you're starting to see that on a national basis right now. That's the issue. You are starting to see this on a national basis. They are not worried about developing these kids. They are worrying about extracting whatever they can over the three years out of these kids, and then it's the NFL's problem. So these kids aren't being nurtured and developed at a lot of these big programs. These OCs, they're they're doing. They're not letting them sit down on the game plans and the installs. All the film work they're doing themselves, and they're just spoon feeding them and putting everything on a silver platter instead of properly developing these kids. And that's why Kyler Murray has something like that in his, I mean, it's happening with everyone. It's not Kyler. It's not just Tua. you see with Trevor Lawrence, you're seeing it with a lot of these quarterbacks. Now look at the most successful quarterback last year in the draft class was Mac Jones. But what's the difference between him and everyone else in the class? He was by far the most coddled. He was more coddled than Herbert. He was more coddled. He was the most coddled guy. They protected him against Buffalo in that game where he only threw a couple times. Right? And the difference is the building and the coaching of the Chargers and the Bengals. That's what the difference has set them aside from last year's class, from, you know, Tua and Love, et cetera, et cetera. So, I don't know, man. It's it's very uh it's very alarming because now you're going to in your in your evaluation and your scouting, you're going to have to make sure that the staff around him there who whatever quarterback you're developing is or sorry, scouting or evaluating for a draft class that they're doing a good job and they're just not. See, this is what worries me about a Bryce Young coming out now. And uh, CJ Stroud, I saw enough about CJ Stroud that I got uh, concerns. So, I mean, you know, you look at all these Ohio State quarterbacks that have fallen on their face all because, you know, the program does everything for them instead of putting them through the ringer in the film room and on the field. Because they can't afford, because these guys cannot afford to lose games. That's the problem with these big, they cannot afford to lose games, so they cannot afford to go through the true growing pains of developing a quarterback properly at the collegiate level. They just can't. Now, the smaller schools can, because they're not expected to win anyways. Right? So, and, and, and you know, I, that's what I look at with Kyler Murray's contract. You know, how much film room do, sessions do you really think he's doing at Oklahoma State? Let's talk about this. I mean, you saw Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts didn't become a better passer when he went to Oklahoma State. Just went to a more pass-heavy offense. And even still, he's missing a lot of wide-open stuff. Shout out to Mario. He said, keep up the good work. Reason you and Dougley are the only Dolphins I actually want to interact with anymore. Man, I appreciate you that. And that's Mario Christogoat. Man, I know a lot of you Hurricane fans have a lot of high hopes this year. So, um, man, I hope nothing but the best for you guys. Junior says, do you think Lamar Jackson can win a Super Bowl with the Ravens? Um, I don't know, man. If you want my honest opinion, I don't know if Herbert's going to win a Super Bowl with the Chargers. So, and that's just my honest opinion, man. So, um, and that's not Herbert. That's more the, the franchise with, with Lamar. The problem is, you know, if defenses have kind of figured him out in terms of putting a bunch of DBs out there, you know, into these, you know, into these dime packages and these exotic packages. And, you know, when you force him to pass in moments that are critical, the results are varying. So I don't know, man, I, I, I don't, 
personally, I don't think Lamar Jackson is going to win a Super Bowl in Baltimore. You know, uh, per- personally. So, um, but hey, who am I to say he can't? Anything's possible, right? Um, so guys, let's 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 start off. Let's get into this. Um, obviously, the news of late breaking in the day um, was this: the Miami Dolphins have signed receiver Mohamed Sanu and released receiver Cody Core with a non-football injury. Now, I know a lot of people are looking at our depth chart and going, oh boy, where does this fit? Um, you know, the pressure's on. You know, it comes down to, are we going to carry seven like we have the last two years? Or are we going to only carry six? Because, I mean, you know, is this a lot of factors are coming into this. Now, is Lynn Bowden and Preston Williams being put on notice? I would lean more towards Preston Williams than Lynn Bowden Jr. Um, I think Bowden offers you a ton to do in this offense, so I wouldn't put him. But I think a big thing that's going on here is I think Muhammad Sanu is being brought in to help our receiver room along in terms of with this new offensive install. Um, you know, you've heard Marcel Louis Jacques on Big O. You've heard Mike Westoff say that they were not impressed from what they saw with this offense when they went to mini camps and such. So I think Mohamed Sanu, do I think he's going to stick? Yes. But I also think um, that a big reason is to help a lot of these guys get through this install. I think Preston's staying. I think, Pre- you know, I think Preston's gone and Bowden's staying. If you ask me reason, I first of all, the thing is with the with the fullbacks and how many running backs it weeds into how many um receivers you're going to carry. Like are we carrying 6 or are we carrying 7 like the past few years because you know obviously Tyreek Waddle, Eric Zakama and Cedric Wilson are locked. So that's four spots. So if we got 6, I'm telling y'all Trent Sherfield's making this team. So I'm putting Trent Sherfield at 5. And I think they there's they got to find a way to keep seven, and then you got to keep Muhammad Sanu at six, and then you got to keep Bowden or Preston Williams. Sanu could just be here for a camp body to literally help out. And remember, another big thing. There's a couple factors here. One, Muhammad Sanu is a very good blocker, a very good blocker. And remember, guys, we want blockers. Right? You know, and this also puts pressure now on how many tight ends are we carrying? Could Shaheen and Seathan Carter be both be odd men out? So this puts a lot of pressure in a lot of different areas right now. And another thing y'all need to keep in mind too, and I keep telling y'all, I've been telling y'all, telling y'all, telling y'all. People keep talking about Jimmy G, Jimmy G. And what do I keep telling you guys? No. I've heard we want to do stuff in this offense that McDaniel and Shanahan did in Atlanta. And I've been telling everyone, stop looking at Jimmy G as a comparison. You got to think more Matt Ryan with what they want to do with two in this offense. They took stuff out of their offense in San Francisco under Jimmy G that they ran in Atlanta because of his arm limitations. Tua has a better arm, is a better athlete than Jimmy G. Right? Remember, Matt Ryan don't have a cannon. But Matt Ryan, you know, more accurate, better ball placement, throws with better anticipation, and a better arm overall than Jimmy G. You know, think of Tua. I'm not Tua and, G, and Matt Ryan is where we got to be thinking about here. I'm not saying Tua's going to be MVP this year. What I'm saying is Matt Ryan's ability to operate a Shanahan offense and thrive in a Shanahan offense that is more the ceiling for Tua than Jimmy G. People are looking at the wrong person. And where was Muhammad Sanu in 2016 when McDaniel and Shanahan were running it in Atlanta? I'll wait. I'll give you guys a chance. Tell me where they were. Who who was in that receiving core in 2016 in Atlanta? What I keep telling you guys, and I'll show you guys when I do my McDaniel offense breakdown for you. That's going to be coming very soon. What? receiver on this roster what now was there exactly stevie muhammad sanu was on the 2016 atlanta falcons 
I keep telling y'all, telling y'all, telling y'all, that's where you got to look. Don't just think San Fran. But everyone just keeps, recency bias keeps everyone locked on San Fran. But see, now you guys are starting to see what I'm telling y'all under unfold. Now you're starting to see it come through roster moves. Right? So, you know, and another reason why I think our offense looks struggling too is, I mean, this offensive line, it's A, a whole new system. B, you know, I know Dieter and Connor Williams have had snapping issues, but also Taron Armstead wasn't out there. So, you know, this signing has a huge ripple effect. And remember, back in 2016, you know, I'm not, Muhammad Sanu had his fourth best season in the NFL. Right, you put up 777 yards. He put up the most touchdowns he um, has in a single season in 2016. Um, so I don't expect seven. I don't even know if you know. I got to see where his body's at right now. Um, he could be just being brought along and brought in to help this this young, other than Tyree Kill, this young wide receiver room, bring him along and help out. Guys, I trust Wes Welker with this move. I trust Wes Welker making this move. So, exactly, Stevie. Devontae Freeman was also very good in that 26. And remember, Devontae Freeman, another late-round pick. Right? Devontae Freeman was very good in that offense. Right? But they had the one... They had... um. Uh, they had the one-two punch. They had uh, they had Devontae Freeman and um, what's his face? Um, uh, what's his name? That backup that took over after he left. Kevin Coleman, right? It was Kevin Coleman. I believe it was Kevin Coleman and him, right? In 2016. So, yeah, Kevin Coleman. So, um, that's, uh, that, you know, I'm telling you guys. All of y'all just focusing on their San Francisco film. I gave y'all a hint on Twitter under King of Finland's tweet when he did his little thing about Jimmy G and I brought up Matt Ryan. So I've even been hinting to y'all on Twitter. The Patreons have known since the beginning of June what the deal is. And I've been telling y'all on this channel a lot recently. Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta. Don't forget what they did in 2016 in Atlanta. Don't just look at San Francisco and the Mohamed Sanu signing. All it does to me is continue to add evidence to that fact and add another layer to that fact. All right. So I'm telling y'all, don't forget Atlanta 2016. Don't forget it. All right. I wanted to show you guys this too. If you guys didn't see it, it was posted on Tyreek Hill's um, YouTube. Guys, th th these boys are putting in the work, baby. These boys are putting in the work. Let's go. Baby, I mean, these guys are putting in the work. I, I I talked to Nick Hicks today, and I just said to him, man, I'm excited to see the results of all the hard work everyone's put in this offseason, man. Like, check your pulse if you're not hyped up right now. I, I am so excited to see, you know, everything come together. I, I'm excited, man. I mean, <sighs> like a kid in a candy store, baby, like a kid in a candy store. Absolutely hyped, man. Um, all right, let's get into everything here. So yesterday we looked at um, 
Barry Jackson's article about five questions on defense facing the Dolphins. So today he did five questions that bear keeping in mind on offense when Dolphins training camp begins on Wednesday. And he keeps saying Wednesday, right? I, I, I don't, I assume he's talking about next Wednesday when the pads come on. Maybe he's talking about tomorrow. I don't know, but I assume he's talking about the, when the pads come on. Um, who's the starting center, left guard, and right tackle? We already all know this. Connor Williams, I had this up on Patreon before anyone even broke it. Connor Williams will be the new starting center unless he bombs in training camp. The Dolphins seem committed to moving him from left guard, and only a bunch of errant snaps or injuries could probably derail the plan. Meanwhile, there are several reasons why the Dolphins would love to make it work with Austin Jackson at right tackle, as we first reported in March. As NFL Network's Daniel Jeremiah said, he's excellent at the outside zone scheme, which the Dolphins are implementing. I mean, I told y'all from the moment we signed McDaniel, he was going to be our starting right tackle. And I remember the pushback, and I remember people were even like, oh, let's throw Hunt back there. I said, no, bro, this is... When you look at athletic profile, this guy's a perfect fit for what they want in this offense. Man, I think I think he's going to be one of the best, biggest surprises for all y'all this year. It's going to be Austin Jackson. You're going to see a different Austin Jackson this year. If they get his footwork and his hand placement down and they get his motor a little bit better and we don't see the reps with his hands on his hips, man. They might get something because I've said this to y'all before. After we signed, right after we signed Taron Arm, said, "What did I say?" And I've said it multiple times. He is the closest thing that we have from an, an athletic profile standpoint on this roster to Taron Armstead. I told y'all from the beginning this was going to happen, and everyone knows I was all out on Austin Jackson. But as soon as we signed McDaniel, I told all y'all this was going to happen. Um, his athleticism is well suited to Miami's scheme. The upside is endless, Jeremiah said before the, that 2020 draft. And the Dolphins believe it's far too soon to give up on the idea of an 18th overall pick as a starter. The Dolphins coaches like Jackson coming out of the draft, as the Dolphins general manager, Chris Greer. The staff believes a, a right tackle is an ideal spot for him. Remember, Jackson played right tackle in high school. So he does have experience playing right tackle, albeit a while ago. He did play it in high school. I left guard. I fully expect Lee Meikenberg to be the starter. Ugh. Unless Williams has snapping issues and move back to guard, as is the case with Jackson. Dolphins management coaches see Eichenberg as an NFL starter unless he proves to them he's not. I mean, last year he, was, he proved he was an NFL starter. I'll, I'll go with it. 6'6", 301, no anchor, right? This guy, if his technique and fundamentals aren't perfect on every rep, we saw last year. It's going to be a wrap. You know, he couldn't handle speed and power rushes on the outside. What's he going to handle now when they're like 320, 330, low center of gravity, taking him off his feet on the interior? Right? I'm talking about pass pro, too. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about just run here. All right? So, yeah, I don't know about that. Taron Armstead will start a, uh, Taron Armstead will start a left tackle. Robert Hunt at right guard. Though this staff is giving a fresh look to Solomon Kinley, who seemingly didn't get a fair shake under the previous regime, Eichenberg is a clear front runner left guard because I've heard Solomon Kinley is out of shape still. Who's the number three running back behind Chase Evans and Raheem Moser? I give the edge to Sony Michelle over Miles Gaskin because Michelle is a better between the tackles runner, agreed. A better runner overall last season, agreed. And the superior pass blocker. Check, check, check. Agreed. I'm telling y'all, Gaskin and Ahmed might be out of here, and Zachondre White might be running back four. Last season, PFF ranked Michelle 61st as a pass blocker among 157 qualified running backs. He allowed one sack and three hurries and 55 pass blocking chances. Gaskin was rated 101st out of 157, allowing one sack but seven hurries and 76 pass blocking chances. All but 22,000 of Gaskin's $2.6 million cap hit is eliminated if he's cut. And none of his two and a half million salary is guaranteed. So that too would come off the books if he's cut. He stands very much at risk. Perhaps he could net a late round draft pick, which is what I've said. The Dolphins eliminate 900,000 of Michelle's 1.7 million cap hit if he's cut. But 500,000 of Michelle's $1.2 million salary has already been guaranteed. So the finances, even the finances favor Sony Michelle. As for the starting job, that should be an interesting battle between Edmonds, Mozart, Michelle could push them. 
Who's the number four receiver? Rookie Eric Izukamo will be on the team, along with Hill, Waddle, and Cedric Wilson, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's the fourth receiver. Preston Williams, Len Bowden, and new addition Mohamed Sanu and Trent Sherfield all have a chance to be the fourth receiver, though that player may not be on the field a ton because Mike Gusecki can line up in the slot as a glorified receiver with Durham Smythe or Adam Shaheen as a second tight end at times. I wouldn't be surprised if any of those five Izukuma, Williams, Bowden, Sanu, or Sherfield emerges as the fourth most used receiver. But Williams, Bowden, Sanu, and Sherfield are likely battling for only two roster spots or potentially one. The way Dolphins receiver coach Wes Welker raves about Sherfield, who played for Welker and Mike McDaniel in San Francisco, I would be mildly surprised if he's cut. I told y'all he's making a team. I've been telling y'all since OTAs I've heard he's got Mac Jones, uh, sorry, Mac Collins' role locked in. Sherfield's making this team. So... I'm telling you, we're, we're, those are your five locked in. Hill, Waddle, um, Cedric Wilson, Azukama, and Sherfield, right? Bowden, Preston, Sanu. It's going to come down for battle of six and seven. And if they're going with six, I would tend to go with Bowden there, man. Um, who's the undrafted rookie with the best chance to stick? Arizona State offensive tackle Kellen Deesh, mostly because the Dolphins gave him the highest guarantee of their 14 undrafted rookies, 140,000. And you all know how much I love Kellen Deesh, so I ain't even going to go off on how, how I think he... Bro, this guy is literally Eichenberg, but a far better athlete. He's 6'7", 301, so he's an inch taller, same size. He is literally Liam Eichenberg with better feet and a better overall athlete. And... When you have short arms, because he has short arms like Eichenberg, you know, when you have certain deficiencies in certain areas, you need that athleticism. Kellen Deesh has that. Um, but his short arms might make him a better fit at guard, which that should be even more of a concern for Eichenberg if they put him at guard. But don't rule out South Carolina running backs to Condre White, who impresses staff in OTAs, anyone who averages 6.2 carries in the SEC, uh, averages 6.2 yards per carry albeit on just 106 career carries, has talent. There could be a scenario where he's kept ahead of Salvin Ackman as the number four back, and Edmonds, Mozart, and either Michelle or less likely Gaskin. Braylon Sanders, a guy who I keep talking about as a potential returner, 21.1 career yards per catch average on 69 catches at Mississippi State, flexes unique skill speed, though his route tree is very limited. He's the perfect candidate to build up on the practice squad. Perfect candidate, Braylon Sanders. The guy runs like a 4 4 what surprise name could be at risk of being cut beyond Gaskin, Ahmed, and a veteran receiver? Because the Dolphins are committing a roster spot to a fullback, Alan Gingold, they must decide whether to keep both an H-back, Seathan Carter, and a fourth tight end, Adam Shaheen, one of the two or neither. Shaheen might again play ahead of Hunter Long if he makes the team, but the Dolphins' depth of position with Gusecki, Smythe, Long, Shaheen puts Shaheen at risk considering none of his $1.6 million salary is guaranteed and there's a $1.8 million cap savings if he's cut. He has a 2.1 million cap hit if he's on the team. Keep in mind that the 49ers, where McDaniel coached, used two tight end sets just 10% of their offensive snaps last season compared to 61% for the Dolphins. So there might not be a need to carry four tight ends any longer. And Hunter Long ain't getting cut. If they're keeping three, it's going to be Hunter Long, Smythe, and Gasecki. Carter, like Shaheen, also seems at risk. None of Carter's $2.3 million salary is guaranteed, and his entire $2.5 million cap hit is eliminated if he's cut. That tackle, Greg Little, also stands very much at risk. So a couple of names you saw as surprise cuts. I would not be shocked if Adam Shaheen and Seathan Carter are cut. Would not shock me. You save a good chunk of money, and you can continue investing in guys like Hunter Long. And why wouldn't you do that? Guys, 498 of you in the room. Smash that like button. Subscribe if you're new. When we started, we were four away from 8,500. Smash that subscribe button. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of good stuff to unpack there in that article um, from Barry. Great article from Barry. Always uh, best in the business uh, from a local perspective, I think, at least. Um, so, yeah, Sanu, I, I think you got to keep seven with the talent you have. Even if you're not keeping Sanu and you're going with Preston and, and Bowden. Injuries happen, man. Injuries happen. But again, you can use Gusecki as a big as a big as a big slot. 
You can use him on the boundary. Kosicki allows you flexibility to carry only six receivers. I do not see them carrying only five. So if this is a, a carry for if this is a, a six receivers they're carrying, well, the first five spots are locked up with Hill, Waddle, Azukama, Cedric Wilson, and Trent Sherfield, I believe. And I think six and seven or just six is going to come down to Bowden, Preston, or Sanu. And I think what Bowden offers you more than Preston or Sanu, and I mean, Preston can do it, but he's got hurt on it, right? I would like Bowden on special teams more than I would like Preston Williams, right? Bowden could be a returner, and we don't have to use one of those big name receivers we got in the top four. Bowden could be our returner. You don't have to turn to Javon Holland like they did last year. You don't got to look at Waddle. I think Bowden offers you return capabilities. Preston's, I like Bowden better as a returner than Preston, and I like him as a returner better than Muhammad Sanu. And usually, special teams, when you get to those depth, those super depth spots, that's what can, you know, that's what, why I've got Sherfield locked in because I've been told since OTAs he's got Matt Collins' role locked in. So that's why I've got Sherfield locked in because of what he offers on special teams. So we'll see how it pans out, man. It's going to be real interesting. It's going to be real, real interesting. All right. Um, article from Daniel Oifusi. Let's get into this one. It says, breaking what to expect from Mike McDaniel's new offense. First year head coach Mike McDaniel will be tasked with leading all 53 players on the Dolphins roster, but this expertise on the offensive side of the ball, where he first learned the game as a ball boy from Mike Shanahan, led Denver Broncos and worked as a longtime assistant with Mike's son, Kyle, is what new Dolphins decision makers to the 39 is what drew Dolphins decision makers to the 39 year old In his debut season in Miami. McDaniel will have a polarizing third year quarterback a much maligned offensive line with a pair of veteran additions and a talented cast of skill position player players to hand and throw the ball to he's bringing in an offense. He's studied over his entire career with maybe some twists and wrinkles first current players, unique skill sets. The first of a two part film study will break down key concepts and tendencies the Miami Dolphins offense is expected to take on with McDaniel at the helm. The zone run, the zone run scheme is expected to be the main run concept McDaniel infuses into the Dolphins offense. Brought from the Shanahan tree over the years, it sprouted in it sprouted in Los Angeles, Cincinnati, and Green Bay with much success. It takes on many forms and can be used with variety various personnel groupings, but the outside wide zone concept will likely be the most prevalent. It all revolves around the idea of creating lateral displacement, said Brandon Thorne, who breaks down offensive line play um, as the owner of the Trench War newsletter. And we'll get into his uh, Brandon Thorne, uh, Brandon Thorne's rank and O-line rankings right after this soon. Um, so not necessarily driving defenders backward as much as it is opening up that front side and cutting off the backside and just trying to hit those in, the, inside those gaps that open up. So making one cut and go from the running back. In the 49ers week one game against the Detroit Lions, they ran an outside zone concept with a handoff to Elijah Mitchell. At the snap, all five linemen stepped laterally to the right, completing their blocking assignments. The flow of bodies allows Mitchell to cut up field and work to the left where defenders have vacated their spots for a sizable gain. So there you go. He's got a screenshot. Oh, he, he this man straight went with a screenshot. He didn't. So the outside zone concept can also take form of a horizontal toss to the running back on the first two plays from scrimmage in week one after a fumble. The 49ers ran this concept back to back with the Mozart, and he picks up large chunks of yardage each time. The first time, the linemen move in unison to the left, and Mozart has the speed to get to the edge. The second time, the linemen move to the right, and Mozart finds that cutback lane. There's multiple reasons for a pitch, McDaniels told the Miami Herald in March. One is when you're confident in your matchups on the edge is to get the ball there a little faster. In the split zone concept, the running back doesn't take the ball at as a wide of an angle as the outside run, zone run, but a player, usually a tight end or fullback, comes across the face of the play in the opposite direction of the lineman and back to block a backside defender. The misdirection aims to confuse the second level defenders and will still create a crease for a cutback lane. The 49ers use this concept in a Week 7 game against the Indianapolis Colts. Tight end George Kettle flows against the moving lineman to seal the defender in pursuit, and that block springs the cutback lane 
for a touchdown. So there you see the initial alignment and that I formation. There you see the block and the cutback, boom. In some situations, McDaniel will call for a pitch play, but instead of tossing the ball horizontally, the quarterback will toss it vertically right to the running back. The lineman will still block for his own run, but with the illusion of an outside toss. If defenders pursue the edge too much and vacate their spots, a cutback lane should be available. San Francisco ran this play in Week 10 against the Los Angeles Rams, with Kittle once again cutting across in a split zone concept i don't know why he just didn't provide the film for us so there you go him cutting across you see right here coming across the left side and you see him getting outside in the passing game in addition to west code style passing concepts that focus on horizontal in breaking routes the dolphins will seek to execute play action passes pass plays that mirror their run plays at the snap. In week one, after executing two toss plays for big gains, the 49ers faked a toss and rolled quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo to the right. The defenders bid on the fake, and two pass casters leaked into the space they vacated. Garoppolo found Kittle for a large gain, much coming after the catch. And this is what I've tried to tell you. With the run in that outside zone, you set up the flow of the game to one side, and then you come at them on the other side, you know, all you got to get is that bite. You can get a even if you get a half fall step from both the linebackers, you're you're gravy. So there you go. The the out of the play action pass, you see Kittle wide open. There's no standalone plays, McDaniel said. If you're going to defend this play and this play doesn't work, you better have something off of that so that another play will work. As opposed to just rolling the dice and throwing random plays at people. Systematically, it's all tied together. Manipulating defenses with play action should assist Tungvaloa to work the middle of the field better, a space that he often neglected last season. 34% of the 49ers' attempts last season went to the middle of the field, which led the NFL, according to Football Outsiders. In 50 games, Jimmy G attempted 302 passes between the numbers on the field, completing 219 attempts per Sports Info Solutions. In 13 games, Tungvaloa attempted 199 passes between the numbers and completed 171 attempts. Attempting passes over the middle of the field should also allow more opportunities for yards after the catch, an area in which San Francisco has excelled in recent years. In 2021, the 49ers averaged 6.9 yards after the catch on passes from Garoppolo, which led the NFL Tungvaloa's 4.8 yards after the catch on passes he threw rank in the bottom six of the league. The biggest thing for us is yak. We want to yak the heck out of teams, Tungvaloa said back in April. Wide receiver runs, and obviously we're going to get into this when I do my film breakdown with Debo. Last season, Debo Samuel emerged as one of the most dynamic players in the NFL as he began to carry the ball more. Along with handoffs from Jet Motions, the 49ers would place Samuel in the backfield and hand him the ball as if he was running, as if he was a running back. The role increased in the second half of the season. Samuel carried the ball 53 times after week eight. In a week 11 game against the Jackson Javille Jaguars, the 49ers used an outside toss play, but with Samuel as the ball carrier. While neither Tyree Kill or Jalen Waddle possessed the build of the six foot two fifteen pound Samuel, McDaniel could find similar ways to get the two sub 4'4", 40-yard dash runners the ball. For his career, Hill has carried the ball 93 times for 719 yards and six touchdowns. Again, you see that I formation. Debo taking it out with uh, Kyle Juszczyk as a lead blocker. See him hit that edge. One of the more interesting phenomenons for the Dolphins offense in 2022 is regarding which players see the field and how often. The Dolphins signed Cedric Wilson Jr. and full, fullback Alec Ingold moved that signal they will be using more 11-man personnel, one running back, one tight end, three receivers, and 21 personnel, two running backs, one tight end, two receivers, as opposed to 12 personnel with one running back, two tight ends, two wide receivers. In 21, 2021, the 49ers used 11-man 11 personnel, 11 personnel on 48% of their plays, according to Sharp Football Stats. Miami used 11 personnel on a league low 28% of the plays. San Francisco used 21 personnel. Most often, the second running back was Kyle Juszczyk. On 34% of the plays, the team's second highest used grouping, the Dolphins ran just 10 plays with 21 personnel and didn't have a traditional fullback on the roster.
And while the Dolphins used 12 personnel on 61% of the plays, the highest rate in the league, the 49ers used that grouping on 10% of their plays. If that carries over to Miami, it could por um, portend a diminished role for one of the Dolphins' top tight ends, whether that be Gasecki, who struggles as a blocker, or Durham Smythe, who blocked way more than Gasecki, but isn't as dynamic as a pass catcher. It's one of the many moving parts my McDaniel will have to sort out in training camp and even during the season. So very interesting stuff. I wanted to give you guys that as a precursor. He touched on a few things that I'll be touching on in my film study that I'll have coming up for you guys regarding the offense, but I'm not just going to be looking at Atlanta again. We're, I, sorry, San Francisco. We're going to be going back and looking at Atlanta too. Okay. So we're going to be a little bit more in depth in terms of looking um, at, at, you know, schematics and concepts and, and footage, right? So, um, we're going to have some Atlanta involved in there. So shout out to Daniel, though. He does a great job, man. Does a great job. Um, USA Today, guys, they came out with their record predictions for this year. And, man, the disrespect is real. They expect us to finish 9-8. and eight. Asterix obviously means you... Um, you make the playoffs. They got the Bengals and the Patriots as the two wild card, as uh, two wild card teams here, and the 49ers and the Cowboys in the NFC. But they got us finishing with the same record as last year, nine and eight. Sorry, and they got the Chargers making the playoffs, um, and the Saints in the NFC. They they got us making and nine and eight got the Saints in in the NFC. Crazy, um, but they got us. They got the Patriots having a better record than us. They got the Bills at fifteen and two. My lord, that is bold. That is bold. 15 and 2 for the Buffalo Bills. Good God. Damn. I don't know who did this at USA Today, but you should fire that whole staff. I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to be the guy to say that. Fire the whole staff. Whoever predicted 15 and 2 for them and, you know, 9 and 8 for us. Fire the whole damn staff. Craziness, craziness. And again, I want to get into this final little thing here. I want to get into um, Brandon Thorne's offensive line rankings. And again, um, he owns a trench warfare newsletter. Um, he's an offensive line and defensive line analyst for Stavis to Run. And he's also the scouting coordinator for um, Offensive Line Masterminds, which is owned by Duke Mayweather. So Offensive Line Masterminds is... You know, they are the upper echelon when it comes to training offensive linemen. All right. They pump out absolute stars. So let's end this on a, on a good note. So ranking the top 15 players at each position on the O-line entering the 2022 season. So this is what Brandon Thorne said. He said, each of the last couple of years, I put together a list ranking the starters across the offensive line entering the season with tiers to separate them into distinct groups. Last year was the first off season. I had this newsletter and I ranked my top 15 at each position on the O-line. This helps me process the landscape of starters entering a season and breaks up players into broader groups of abilities that crystallize where certain guys fall in the pecking order relative to their peers. The order within tiers is more malleable and can be debated while the cutoff points between tiers are more of a concrete way of stacking players. The tiers are based on my one to seven grading scale that I use for my trait based style of scouting. It helps to look at the pool of players in the NFL on a spectrum over a bell curve. The bulk of the players fall somewhere between three to five average performers while the numbers shrink on the margins, one to two lower performers and six to seven high performers. One, means you're elite. These players win essentially all reps against any level of competition below elite while splitting them evenly with other elite players. There are very few players inside this tier at any position in a given season, and it represents the smallest bucket of players, along with Tier 7, which we'll get to so shortly. Um, this rarefied group produces um, scheme transcendent players that regularly play at an all-pro level regardless of the situation around them. Tier 2 is very good. These players are impact starters that win the majority of their reps against lower tiers of players, split them amongst other Tier 2 players, and can compete with Tier 1 players in spurts. The group is where the most all-pro and Pro Bowl selections come from and are often referred to as blue-chip starters. 
three is good or above average. These players compete with the majority of competition across the NFL. They rarely win any rep handily, lose most of them when isolated against higher tiers, and are referred to as red chip starters. Red chip players or above average good starters can have Pro Bowl selections on their resume with some blue chip traits. However, they lack the consistency of higher tier players and are often more dependent on the system and the players around them for success. Tier four is solid or average. These players form the lifeblood of most NFL rosters. They have dependable skill sets and can be developed into tier three players. They often have a more clearly defined ceiling than tier three players with high floors to stick around as starters for half a dozen or more years if they're in the right system. Um, for this purpose, he's not using any grade below tier four. So we won't see adequate or below average in five marginal in six and seven is poor. All right. So this is how he's got left tackles. Yeah. You read that right. He's got Taron Armstead as the number two tackle in the NFL tier one elite. So Trent Williams, he's got a number one saying he's coming off one of the best and most dominant seasons we've seen. I mean, I've said this, I said him and Aaron Donald were the best players in the NFL last year. But number two, Taron Armstead, despite coming off of a year where he started just eight games due to injury while averaging 11 starts per year over his last five seasons, Armstead remains firmly, firmly a tier one left tackle in football due to the undeniable talent, skill level, and impact when on the field. Armstead is a true shut down tackle on an island who can take out premier rushers with minimal help while being an impact scheme versatile run blocker. This isn't even factoring in Armstead's renowned leadership qualities off the field and in the locker room, which will reverberate throughout the offensive line room and organization in Miami. Playing in a new head coach, Mike McDaniel's old line friendly system will only solidify and amplify Armstead's rare skill set in 2022. And the key word there is amplify. What did I tell y'all? Trent Williams came over there. They traded a third and a fifth for him. Everyone thought health-wise, he was washed up. Talent-wise, he was on his last chance. Now, Trent Williams is one of the best players in the NFL. Taron Armstead is now coming under McDaniel. What do you think Taron Armstead's going to transform into? We should see an even better tackle in that system than what Trent Williams was. Because Taron Armstead, I think, is more talented than Trent Williams. Trent Williams, like I'm talking about like traits wise and such. And Taron Armstead, you know, you know, he's coming over playing at a higher level coming under McDaniel than what Trent Williams was playing at when he came under McDaniel. Right. So if I got a player who's coming in playing at not a really high level that people think is watched up and gets elevated to one of the best players in football compared to a guy coming in already considered one of the best players at his position, already playing at a high level before he comes in as coach, automatically that tells me the ceiling in this offense is higher for Taron Armstead. I mean, for Christ's sakes, they motioned Trent Williams last year. What do you think they can do with Taron Armstead? Right, and then David Bacchiardi finishes off tier three. They got Rashawn Slater at number four, Larry Tunsil at five, Tyrone Smith at six, Ronnie Stanley at seven, Orlando Brown at eight, um, Deion Dawkins at nine, Trent Brown at 10, Jonah Williams at 11, and Jake Matthews at 12. And then we get into the tier four guys, Taylor Decker, uh, Colton Miller. So, you know, I hey, this is for paid subscribers. All I needed to show y'all is this. This is, you know, we've been hammering, at least I've been hammering, on how ESPN disrespected the hell out of Taron Armstead. Now we got a literal offensive mind, uh, offensive line mind, an offensive line guru telling us he's the second best left tackle in football. Who do you think I'm going to listen to? The jabronis at ESPN or Brandon Thorne? I'm going to listen to Brandon Thorne every single time, baby. Every single time. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me and tonight's show. Still 463 of you. Um, I know we reached up to about 514 in the room tonight, man. I appreciate all of you for coming out. Um, be on the lookout, man. Me and Neil are starting back up next week. Um, me, Richmond, and Ballgame are scheduled to start uh, tomorrow night, but I might push it back to next week. I haven't figured it out because i got something in the works. Um, but 
guys, I'm going to be back. Um, and, and we're going to keep covering training camp. Uh, as, as soon as stuff starts coming out, I'll be back. Now, I will be back either tomorrow or Thursday. Um, if there's enough stuff to talk about, I'll be back tomorrow night. And we'll keep going with training camp. Um, but, man, we're there, baby. We're there. We're there. Training camp has officially started. Y'all know what time it is. Fins up all day, every day, beyond the grave in which we'll lay. I'll see y'all on the next one. Fins up, baby. Check your pulse.